Hello, my name is Julian Fersing. Welcome to a new episode of my podcast. Our guest today is Minase Wasinski. Minase is a construction engineer working since five years in Norway. We can consider him as a BIM evangelist since he is a co-founder of BIM Corner, an education platform dedicated to BIM technology, focusing on the, the different methodology and sharing the importance of these new methods in the construction industry. He's working also as a BIM software developer at Nor Consult, a large consultant company in Norway, focusing on the development of BIM coordination tools for the construction site. Ignace, welcome. Thank you for having me, Julian. Ignace, to start this podcast, I wanted to use one of the projects which was awarded recently, a different prize. Uh, it's known as the IC project. It was one of the largest projects happening in Norway. Tell us a bit more about your role in this project and also in particular the different challenge that you were facing during it. Okay. So actually, as you mentioned, we in Norconsult Information Systems, because Norconsult have its sister company, which is called Norconsult Information Systems, we are designing EC project. This is a web application, which is actually developed with collaboration with AF Group. AF Group, a big, one of the biggest contractor in Norway, they were rewarded with, uh, they won actually a tender uh, mm -hmm. from governmental uh, for E39 road. This is a very long, one of the longest roads in, in Europe okay. because it's connecting the, the coastal, uh, the coastal Norway from, from the bottom to almost Trondheim. So it's more than 1000 kilometers. And I have group N wants the tender and in the tender, it was written that they need a special CDE, Common Data mm -hmm. Environment. Mm -hmm. Common Data Environment, which will uh, fulfill some of the requirements, and there was not such uh, tool in the market. Mm -hmm. That's why they, they thought that, because they won the tender with Norconsult, so they asked Norconsult, okay, guys, can you, can you make such things for us? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why it started, actually. So we are financed with money from AF Gruppen and from Norconsult. There must be a lot of data also like in, in infrastructure because we always talk about BIM as a building, yes, mm. but in infrastructure, obviously, you have like totally other uh, scale of the, yeah, of the it's project. Totally, totally other scales. Like uh, when we are talking about construction, we are talking about millions, but about roads, there are billions mm -hmm. actually. So, so money was there, but there was no solution. Like we should think of, about the solution and actually create it. So noise, we can call it noise, not consult information system, start to develop uh, this, uh, this web platform, EC project. And, um, and yeah, they are there. We are doing quite a great job. It's still in development. It still mm -hmm. needs some uh, adjustment and improvements, but this is quite powerful tool and it will be sold afterwards, not only for AF group, but also for public. So okay. we are tr Noise is trying to release uh, the EC project as a product for other okay. companies as well. So that's really interesting. So it's like starting on a development of a product for a specific project and then to open that as a standalone product for the whole market. Exactly, exactly. This was actually the point for Norconsult. From the beginning of the project, it was like already to develop by, by having like in mind that it will be a product from the market? I'm not sure because actually I entered the development team uh, one and a half year after the mm -hmm. uh, beginning of the development phase. As I remember, they already had some kind of plan that if we build such platform and it will be used in one of the biggest projects in, in roads. So we know that other projects will we want to have such uh, such mm -hmm. a tool as well, so mm -hmm. we will sell it maybe. Okay. And what was the approach when you started to develop a product which doesn't exist? Yes, it's easier to improve something, but starting from a what page? What were the different challenges that you were mm. facing? Starting from the project and some insight about how do you approach such a large scale project which will take as you mentioned, a few years uh, until it will be fully prepared. As you mentioned, it was a challenge. There were such features in other tools, but not all of them. So we had to gather one feature from this product, one feature from this product, one feature from this product, and combine them in one tool. For us, uh, actually, we 
tried not to look at other products as much, but try to rethink how we would like to have it. Because uh, other products have already some kind of boundaries. They have a boundaries and we wanted to have like open mind, okay, let's build the, the tool, how we would like to use it. Mm -hmm. For example, from my perspective, I tried to be a, we can call it in Norwegian Schlutbrücke, so the end user, how me as a BIM coordinator would use this tool. What will be beneficial for me? How I will just move, uh, move because this, this tool will be web, so it will be on tablets. It's how I will move, for example, uh, models, how I will check the documents, or so on, so on, so on. So we try to, to make our own way of designing the product. Could you share with us some lessons learned that you had uh, during the development of it? This is a good question, but maybe quite challenging. I will say like uh, from my personal perspective, because uh, just a, a bit of background. When I changed my job from beam coordination to noise, mm -hmm. to, to be a system developer, I actually didn't code professionally before as much as I'm doing right now. So for me, approach to learning new things like programming was different. Because in Easy Project, there were a lot, it's, uh, as I said, it's web uh, application. There were backend and frontend tasks, um, like uh, visual tasks and the, the whole logic which stands back in on the servers. I would focus on just one thing not doing everything because uh, not doing like a bit of front end, a bit of back end. So personally, as a programmer, I would uh, like focus on one thing and do one thing best. Mm -hmm. Actually, from a perspective of a project, it have to be more specified uh, regarding the goals which we yeah. should map. Mm -hmm. For example, if the tender part want to have such solution, they should describe uh, very specifically how the solution would work, mm -hmm. would work. So from time to time there were just general sketches how we think it should work but uh, for us is building uh, mm -hmm. a thing and afterwards we are uh, we are getting a review no this is not what we were expecting yeah. I know that this is the part of uh, software development you know life but from as you said what are the challenges or what are the lessons I think that to force people who are asking for a product to be more specific. Mm -hmm. The quality of the briefing, yes, like exactly. when you start a project. It's something that we are facing like uh, uh, in, in this industry. We are coming with this beam technology to clients. They don't know what it is and they just heard the buzzword and they say that, okay, I want beam on this product, make us an offer. What do you want? What's exactly? We don't know. Just make us an offer. Well, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I appreciate also the, the insight that you give about not going too much in the detail to focus on one thing and do it right and not to try to diverse too much yourself. I have the feeling that with many projects, even in just beam modeling, we go so much in the details of one stuff and mm -hmm. we forget the, the whole picture. Often I see some practice which are, for example, uh, already modeling that the screw of the window, like LOD 500, but we even didn't define the openings of the window uh, with exactly. the engineers. Yeah, that's that's correct. And even though such such modeling afterwards, it will be a waste of time because no one will use this information yeah. in uh, afterwards. The quality of the briefing define what is the use case, define what you want to do with the those information, what you want to do with the model, and how it looks like the platform. Do you feel that? A way of working would be to firstly have the end interface and after on the back hand to just find how to connect this everything. It was made like this, as you said, that there were sketches already gave to general contractor to AF group, uh, which they actually uh, checked if uh, they revised them and if the solution was okay for them, we get the green light, you know? Okay. But actually, from time to time, those requirements were changing, like during the progress of the project. And from time to time, those changes were very, like they were breaking changes, we mm -hmm. can say it in a, in a software development slogan. So some sketches we should go out, we should replace those sketches with a new one. So I'm not sure if it was an error of, I don't know if there, if there was an error in project management of this, uh, of the, actually this part, but I think that 
this is how the software development mm -hmm. is developed. You know, mm -hmm. we are coming to one point. Okay, this is not not good. We are doing a other thing to to make to make a whole project happen. Yeah, exactly. We talk about like the different modeling tools and so on that we are using to start a project. Those tools are already like more than 20 years old. To name two of them, like Revit, Archicad, those tools exist uh, since the 90s. Mm -hmm. Now programming starts to be more and more important. You have like in the last edition of both those Revit and Archicad, you have more and more visual scripting, Python script. Do you feel that modeling is still the future of how we will make projects? I think yes. We should actually uh, see the world as, as it holds. There are a lot of countries, we received on Beam Corner a lot of questions about how to actually change from 2D to 3D. So from the world perspective, I think that those, uh, those tools still will have a good times and they are still, we can say, in increasing curve of, uh, of users. But when we are talking uh, strictly to to tools, I think that we are changing a bit, like Revit or Archicad are desktop tools. Mm -hmm. Autodesk have a great, uh, great platform, which is called Autodesk Forge, which we are using on EC project. And uh, Autodesk is a smart company, which knows that we are actually uh, in, in near future, we are actually transist from desktop to web. So I think that those tools will be transfer to web as a web application mm -hmm. and you will have Revit on your machine. Yeah. You don't need to install it, have all the direct X stuff going on on your machine. You don't care about it. Mm -hmm. There will be one source of proof, you know, with the web. Yeah. So I think that uh, with a 5G, which is coming with uh, big steps, I think that transition those uh, tools to web will be obvious. Mm -hmm. I definitely believe uh, in that there won't be any more software because right now what is limiting is software as uh, we know it in a traditional way. You just look at, for example, like Adobe, Photoshop, you can use it on the web. Uh, Word, Excel, they are all working on the web uh, yeah, also. Yeah, and right. uh, we are more and more mobile. We want mm. to have access to the data. As you said, we need one central file uh, which have everything. So I also picture this future where you will just log on your project and you will have the tools to allow you to make as an architect the job of the architect, as an MEP engineer the job of, of the engineering and all the simulation and so on all in a central file. Technically there will be no IFC file but the data which will be transferred will be IFC files mm -hmm. you know but that we, we won't see them. Yeah. As we are doing, for example, uh, BIM collaboration using BCF formats, mm -hmm. okay, we actually, there are some, some tools which transfer our BCF format files from one uh, place to another, and we don't see those files, but mm -hmm. actually they are in, yeah. in the background. So IFC, fi IFC file will be not actually dead, it will be used, but, but with, we can say with different clothes. Yeah, it will be like uh, like any website. Yes? It will run on the background, but the end user won't see any of the old files which are behind the website and so on. Exactly. You just have the interface of it. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So it will be, I think, more user-friendly. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And coming back to uh, your question about visual scripting. So I think that visual scripting still will be for a couple of years uh, from now. Uh, still will be, we can say, an add-in uh, to, to the, those base applications like Revit or Rhino and will help architects to define their design, their thoughts. But they, they might be a problem. I don't think that they will just replace those, those uh, tools like Revit or Archicad mm -hmm. because Revit and Archicad is so much more than just course. visual scripting and making some some impressive uh, shapes, models, and uh, data transfer. There, there is a, we can say, we can call it in Poland combine. It's a, like a huge machine with uh, all the futures, which they can do to, to make our BIM project successful. Do you think that those tools will um, remove all the annoying part, which is just to produce this 2D documentation? So that's 
the architect or engineer doesn't have any more to draw 2D lines and uh, focus only on the creativity part. I think that it's actually it's happening right now that uh, we can it's it's happening like step by step. Then there are a lot of companies which already have their own IT uh, groups which mm -hmm. are actually helping architects engineers to uh, get rid of those repetitive tasks using visual uh, scripting dynamo grasshopper using plugins for uh, for revit for example so i think that this situation is happening of course uh, it's it depends on the company it depends on on what kind of task we are talking about but i think in a couple of years uh, this repetitive tasks will be actually replaced by smart design scripts, which will do this boring job for us. Technology is not stopping. As you just give like a few examples, it's all the time evolving. How do you see this transition? How much time it will take for uh, practice to be able to make the switch, knowing that there is more and more IT programmation? Mm -hmm. I think uh, because um, I'm actually a goal-oriented oriented person, and I think that each company should have such approach, what kind of goals you wanted to achieve, okay? And try to use this technology to achieve those goals. We, we shouldn't think about uh, in, a, in a way, oh my God, they are doing such amazing things with visualization, artificial intelligence, big data, so on, so on. Of course, those companies, like big companies, will have money for uh, R&D, for test projects. To, they, they invest a huge amount of money to to check new solutions. So when we are talking about smaller companies, just don't try to catch them, but just go with your pace, but try to go forward step by step. I think this is, this is the best solution here. But what is stopping companies right now, I think is the, the way of thinking for people, because we are talking right now about the projects in Norway. They are using BIM in level three, that there will there is no transfer of data like with the files, but the files are transferred in a background, one source of uh, one source of uh, truth with CDEs. The problem is not like the technology or uh, the, the pace in which we will go forward, but the mentality to just start go forward mm -hmm. because you should start go forward to reduce this gap and try to embrace the technology. But people don't want to because they don't understand it or maybe they they feel comfortable with the situation yeah. which they have right now. But as you said, we receive a lot of uh, a lot of messages from, for example, from Brazil. They, they are reading us. A lot of Brazilians don't speak English. So they are asking us, can we actually copy everything which you wrote and make it in Brazilian, so we will make the Brazilian beam corner or something <laughs> like that. Or the same was in, in, in China, mm -hmm. actually. So we get the messages that we could make the um, profile in China. So, so, so this is great that the, the countries are developing and they are going forward, but a lot of people still in, in, um, in those countries will think like uh, a bit about technology, like this is not for me. Mm -hmm. So so we don't need to be aware of the pace uh, in which the technology is embracing, but we, we, we should start to make it. Yeah. Focusing on quick wins, like small, like small but achievable quick wins, which when you add them, when you, you pile them up, it allows you to make my, milestone in the company. Show the client that this is very valuable. You can gather this data and use it in another place, for example. Mm. So the client will be, wow, I didn't know that this is possible. And they will maybe award you with another project. Mm -hmm. and this is how this progress would should go, you know? The, yeah. I, I think that step by step, nothing, no one built their room in one day. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Sustainability during too many times was uh, seen as the the extra stuff, yes, it's the extra label that I can have on my building to have a price and just good PR and so on. We are green, everybody is happy and so on. And nowadays, it's it's no longer uh, a nice thing to have. It, it starts to be, or it is already a must have, yes. The construction industry is one of the most polluting uh, industry worldwide. Okay. So how BIM 
could have an impact on that during and after the construction. When we are producing the project, we can divide, um, generally speaking, into different phases. I think from the conceptual phase, it would be great if we would, for example, use uh, BIM as a site analysis tool where we can um, move our, uh, our building uh, or we can put an algorithm for us to, to decide where our building should be placed to get uh, a lot of sun, most sun, for example. We could make that and why this is, it might be a sustainability friendly, we can say, or green. Because if we have um, warmed enough uh, room, so we don't need to have uh, AC conditioners and use power to just uh, heat it or, or make it cooler. So the site analysis, I think this is one of the great uh, beam uses, which, which are strictly connected to sustainability goals. Solar uh, wind analysis as well, because if we placed the building in, in a right correct positions, it will not affect uh, environment around the building as much as it uh, would be with, uh, with like a random solution. Drawing less projects, uh, which are very, which are gaining the popular popularity in, for example, in Norway, where where you don't use drawings to actually produce uh, produce um, building, but you actually use tablets and digital tools to make it happen. So such things, of course, sustainability analysis like Dream and Lead, they okay. also uh, have a huge impact on 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 making the the buildings more greener. We can say so. So I think that BIM models can do actually a lot for for us, for for people who are creating buildings in different phases. For facility managers, they can give give you an insight about maintenance uh, scheduling. When we will maintenance uh, our building to, for example, reduce the losses about the products which we are changing, which we are replacing. You don't need to, for example, replace one chiller right now. Maybe you see the data which is connected from, for example, sensors, and you see, ah, I don't need to, to, to change it, or I need to change it right now. I thought it, it, uh, it will be in a year. So, so gathering data in BIM models can have a, a lot of powerful uh, applications afterwards during the operation phase. How do you think... Um client which is developing a project should approach those uh, objectives. The people which are developing the project, they are not the ones which are owning it after. So how to approach something like that? Does it have to be the same price? Uh, kind of saying that, okay, you can have solar and it doesn't cost you more, or will it be more and more strict norms which will force everybody to have to comply to that? I think the norms will be great because everyone has to attach to them. That's the, the one point from, but from the other point, as you said, if the developer don't care, so should client or investor care about it and should have a, a more detailed plan how to, how he would like to have it. Mm -hmm. So I think in this part, this is the investor's uh, responsibility to have a good knowledge about how to, how to make uh, it happen. Of course, the clients. This is this is clients like code of conduct. What is what they feel it's it's uh, it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. If they want to make it like PR, we cannot force them to 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 change it. You, know, so you, you have spent quite a lot of time already in Norway. What were the the different challenges that you were facing uh, when you arrived uh, to Norway? Like the language is whole different. The culture is whole different. Actually, the first challenges were the dialects in the language, because I don't know if listeners know, but Norway have about 50 different dialects and the country is 5 million inhabitants. So this is quite crazy. It's very difficult to understand some words and go to the meetings and talk with, for example, Danish people who speak Danish, but Norwegian people understand them. So they don't change the language. So the language was the, the biggest challenge for the first, I think, yeah. From, from like business perspective, I think uh, that there was a lot of new things which I should learn in a quite short period of time. 
So that I love it. I'm a tech guy, so I love it. But for me, it was a bit stressful because it, I didn't know if I will met requirements of, of the job which I was hired to into. So it, it, is it when you move to nowhere that you started to move uh, in the programming part or it's something which happened when you were there? When I moved to Norway, I was working here in Warsaw in, um, as a BIM engineer mm -hmm. in WSP company. Okay. And I had already uh, experience with BIM models. Yeah. I was working in structural team. So I get a job as a BIM coordinator for one of the biggest projects in Norway and they already put me there. Okay. You know? And maybe I convinced them with, <laughs> with, uh, with what, I've, uh, what I've done because actually in Poland we were doing the projects for UK and we were doing a big project in London near mm -hmm. the London Eye Shell Redevelopment Center which was a huge, huge investment. And they knew that I have knowledge of uh, how to how to um, how to manage information in BIM models in such big yeah. investments. That's why I think they put me into this project. I was doing some programming to help myself with BIM coordination to, as we mentioned before, to get rid of those repetitive tasks. So I use programming as well. I get a, a role as a VR and AR implementator in multi-consult. I was a, a big fan of those technologies and um, I asked my leaders, can I, can I have a bit uh, a side project which I could develop? And afterwards I found out that coding is quite fun and I would like to do it more, more often. That's why I changed to Norconsult. What, you, what would be the three main usage of BIM that you have seen, which were new for you? Some smart or new way of, of using BIM in the construction industry? So the, the first move, I think, was facility management. How we actually had to create data in our models for facility managers, that they will use it in, uh, in operational phase. I didn't know, I actually didn't work with such, such projects. The um, data which we produced before were like, okay, maybe we'll use them, but in no way the, the, the production of data is very specific. We get the requirements, which kind of data we want in each object and how we will implement this information in each object that the facility management uh, manager will get the most out of it. Mm -hmm. So the facility management was the first one. The second one for sure was virtual reality and the meetings in virtual reality and how actually it might be done and the gaming in how to use BIM models to, to make a game to uh, show like governmental participants how the model will look like. For example, we had a project and the project is ongoing. They asked me to build a game. A game of a metro uh, in Oslo. This is for Nobiban metro. They wanted to show how um, the one of the stations will look like, but they didn't want to show like the normal model. But can we make a game that we are in the model, as you showed me on the iPad, that we are in the model and we can give someone, a, I don't know, pad or keyboard yep. and they go in, uh, enter to the station, go to, to the metro train, uh, go to another uh, station. So um, that was the point. And we make such game and afterwards we go to government because it was a governmental, for sure governmental project and they love it. So, so they, they mm -hmm. see the, the game and uh, they love it. They understand like the yeah. concept of how we would like uh, that this station will look like in, in, in the future. Yeah, so, BIM is all about collaboration. Having tools to make the people understand what is behind. It's like a communication tool, mm -hmm. yes. It's like we exchange data, but this is visual data and has importance for the clients to understand mm -hmm. what is in the mind of the architect. Nothing compared if you just can be in this space and now the technology allowed that. So often um, it was seen as just purely PR stuff saying that, yeah, it's beautiful visual and that's it. In the context of like, Nowadays, can you imagine that we will just mix for the clash detection uh, in the model? Actually, it's happening. For example, V-Rex or Dimension 10, there are startups uh, built in, uh, in Norway. Uh, they provide such solutions. They provide such solutions that you actually um, rent a room, upload your model, 
uh, invite guests, I will receive BCF file with uh, all the clashes which I have found out, for example, and we can revise them step by step by putting our head mounted headset on our eyes, have two pads and then go and actually uh, check the collisions. So this, um, this situation which you described is already happening. Of course, I think because I already, um, during my work in multi-consult, when I was implementing VR and AR, I saw that there are a lot of, uh, lot of um, barriers which stops those technologies to be implemented as quickly as everyone would expect to be. VR actually is, uh, is a technology which have a direct impact on your body, I mean on your eyes. When we are taking into consideration, for example, if I would uh, sit with VR glasses for one hour after, after taking them out, I would feel a bit dizzy, my eyes will maybe hurt a bit, I would feel not comfortable at all. So we in, in VR, uh, those, as I said, those tools exist, but maybe technology is not as, as developed as, as it should be. Yeah. The same with AR. For example, we tested HoloLens. Even producer, the Microsoft, told us that, yeah, this is the first version and actually you cannot use them in construction uh, in construction because the discrepancy between real model and the real uh, real model and the real building is too big so you cannot uh, use it as actually a specific tool so the technology is developing the 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 tools are developing they are coming into the construction but i think that still they need mm -hmm. improvements I personally had the chance to, to try the magic leap, for example, mm -hmm. also augmented reality. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it's like out of the table, we were just yeah. looking at the model. And I understand like for accuracy and long usage, it's not yet mm -hmm. ready, mm -hmm. but right now has a, a way of consuming 3D data is already impressive. I'm curious what will be the way that we will consume those models. We talk about how you will be able to take that out of the online pages. For example, Apple uh, developed AR kit. You can literally from the website take out the object and put it to your room. Uh, yeah. So it's like the barrier between the virtual and the real starts to vanish. And how do you approach the change management? Actually, in no way. I, I didn't feel any barriers from my managers. So when I asked my leaders, uh, can I use this technology for tests to, 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 to check something if uh, those technologies might be beneficial for our projects, I had the green light. So from, from no way perspective or place where I was working in multi-consult, I didn't need to convince anyone. But as we are speaking, for example, I, I tried to implement VR in a project, in Tonsberg uh, CityUs project, where there were architects, and I didn't want to force anybody to use it. I, I just present them another way of working. They might work with it, they might use it, or they need, didn't need to. So, so there were, they, they had a the choice. And actually when we mm, use such approach, so a lot of like old school people just came to, to just use those VR sets just to see how it is. Mm -hmm. Some of them liked them. Some of them not because, for example, they were dizzy, they feel dizzy, they feel uh, uh, uncomfortable with it. But some of them they were using it afterwards. So from my perspective, I didn't feel any, anyone who is saying, no, 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 I will not use it at all. So, so maybe I'm lucky guy. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, I, I know that the situation is quite different in, in other places. What do you think has caused such a fast implementation in the Nordics? Why BIM is so much used in construction sites in Norway or in full Scandinavia? For example, in Switzerland, Switzerland is from uh, the nine consecutive years has been elected as the most innovative country in the world. And yet I don't see BIM everywhere on the construction sites. Why Norway? Why Scandinavia? That's, that's a good question. I think mm, there are a couple of reasons. One, I think that, the, for example, Scandinavia or Norway uh, 
in the construction company in the construction sector there are a um, couple of big big uh, gamers which actually um, show how the things should be done those players have money to invest uh, to the technology and that's why they are making the market going on and on and use and uh, embrace a new and new challenges this is the one thing the other thing and i think the most important is governmental support mm -hmm. that government from the beginning of starting the 3d revolution in, in construction modeling they they were um, they put the thumbs up actually they wanted to have it they wanted to to use new technologies in construction industry because they knew that technology can reduce the time uh, when of building the building of creation the building and in no way the the labor time is very expensive so norwegian government is quite uh, quite smart in this matter and they just ask themselves how to reduce this time maybe embracing a new technology which will reduce the time and um, we can afterwards sell our knowledge about this technology to another country as the UK is doing right now. Yeah. A lot of people, when I ask, they think that UK actually developed the, the concept of BIM, which is not true, but they are very, very great in marketing and pushing their standards into, into, into the market that a lot of people thinking that UK is, is creating the BIM with ISO, ISO, for example, standards. Coming back to the question, so, um, as I said, governmental support for, for usage, uh, use of, uh, of BIM. And we should be frank with, with, uh, with the thing that Norway is quite a wealthy country. They have a lot of money which can invest in, uh, in the technology. Uh, they know that the oil and gas will, will come to the end in the nearest future. So they have to, they have, they, they are not agriculture country at all. So they have to have something which can serve to other countries as an export product. Mm -hmm. And technology is one of the fields. And I think that and there are huge investments in Norway in technology and testing and uh, education in this area. That, that's why, because they want to be the technological hub of Europe. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting because we are also a wealthy country. We also have really limited place, yes. There is a lot of thing to, to, to learn from the Nordics and uh, a lot to learn about using this technology directly on the construction site as well. If we look in the topic about reducing the labor cost, one immediate element which comes to my mind is robots. Have you already met some robots on the construction sites and what type of usage, what role they had? I actually met robots on the construction site two times. One robot was in a construction site to uh, drill a holes for the cutouts for installation. So robot had already his own computer where the model was uploaded with the placement, exact placement of cutouts. It was one, one thing and another thing was the excavator, which it's not maybe a robot, but actually it was autonomous excavator, which had already a model and uh, it dig a precise hole with the precise slope regarding, regarding the slope from the model. The University Hospital of uh, Stavanger, one of the biggest public construction right now happening in Scandinavia, they are using the 3D scanning, which can be done like you with robots. They were using the artificial intelligence to compare the, 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 the point of cloud with the model. North Consult has a role also on, on, on this project. North Consult have some consultants, mm -hmm. uh, BIM coordinators from actually Noise. Okay. So my colleague from, uh, from my group, from BIM and Construction Group, he, he's uh, BIM responsible in, in SUS uh, so the Stavanger University Hospital. Mm -hmm. But there is a Kovi, which is a main, main uh, okay. designer. After the construction, during the operation maintenance phase of the building, IoT is also like the same as VR becoming more and more mainstream. I mean, now everybody can have some IoT at home, yes, like Google Home, Google Home, uh, Apple Home Kit. You just 
buy it uh, online, everything starts to, to be connected uh, and easy to install. Do you see some potential connection between the IoT and the BIM world? I saw some sensors put it on construction just to measure, for example, heat, to measure uh, the temperature of uh, different spaces. And when we see IoT um, as a technology, so there are sensors which are uh, which gather data, which gather some values, but you need to have some uh, some background where those sensors are and what kind of data they use. So when we connect it to BIM, so our background is building or road or any other object, 3D model object, and the values we can actually measure what we want. Let's say that temperature is the, the, the thing which we want to connect. So there are companies which actually put the, the sensors in the building to measure the, the temperature to afterwards plan how the heating will be organized in the building, for example. So um, also you can connect um, sensors to chillers and afterwards to the BIM model. So facility manager don't need to go actually to the place, uh, to, to, to the spot to see the chiller, but he can see it in uh, in an iPad and he knows, gets some information from iPad about the chiller, for example. Yeah. Uh, another, another great example of how to, IoT can be used is, or is used already, uh, situations that someone have to, um, someone have to drill a hole in, in a wall to, to, to install something. So sensors will give you a precise location of this thing. So you don't need to guess where is it, but mm -hmm. actually you know the placement. And when the sensor is connected with the BIM model, so, so you have already the information uh, right in front of your eyes. Mm -hmm. So you feel that facility management can be used for a residential mm -hmm. uh, building, which have not so many complex installation, or is it only for managing airports, hotels, campus? I should say that we, we should approach BIM in a more practical way. And we should ask ourselves, okay, let's, let me say that I'm building a small residential house. The cost of operation will, I estimate that they will be such and such. Implementation of this uh, technology in my project will cost me this and this. Let's estimate, I don't know, one million. Operation cost will be five million. Does it give me a value in a long term distance, in long term, in like uh, 20, 15 years? If yes, so, so I should say that BIM is for every project, but we should be practical. If we don't see a value actually, that added value, because you will not use BIM in uh, such a way that it will save a lot of money for you in s a small project. So maybe this is not a practical way. Maybe just get rid of it. Mm -hmm. But this is, this, I'm, I'm a very practical person because from time to time we receive questions from owner wants to have everything from BIM. But the question is, what do you want? Mm -hmm. Actually, why do you want it? The same is with uh, small projects for facility management. Do you really need it? What, what kind of value can it give you in a long term? This approach of goal oriented that, that you have is really interesting. I, wondered like if over the application of BIM and the so-called standards of BIM should come has you, what you're sharing from good practice which are becoming standards do you think that BIM should be mandated should be ruled by European standards for example or it should be each country's each companies each individual which are setting up their own standards and if so how do you collaborate with, uh, with them? Great question. I think that common standards would help us because everybody would uh, work in the, same, in the same way. But I know that it will be very difficult to, to get. There are ISO standards which actually everybody can rely on because ISO is like multi-international. But as you said, the, the, there is no one golden, golden solution, golden rule. 
because from one perspective it would be great to have one standard which is mandated from one organization but from the other perspective the countries are different the, their development is different their economical situation is different and we need to i think that the standard should be uh, tailored to actually the organization how it's structured one organization is structured in a one way another in another way and we can say higher level demands from the government would not fit to one or another organization so i think that it, it would be difficult to to actually incorporate into different organizations so i think that organizational standards which are um, which are based on some yeah guidelines so guidelines mm -hmm. would be the best solution mm -hmm would be the best solution because in some guidelines they may they may ask okay you have to have one beam coordinator there one beam manager there and some beam engineers in to check this 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 but from from your organization perspective you are checking those requirements and you are saying my god i don't have so much people to get this job done so you have to adjust to those standards so i think that the standards organizational standards would uh, which fits, which try to, to comply with those, uh, with those international standards or national standards would be the best yeah. solution. You, you mentioned that something really interesting about having enough internal resource, uh, having enough uh, internal people to be able to achieve those objectives. Mm -hmm. Do you think that in the construction industry we'll have like new players which will start to, to appear on each project to achieve those common objectives? I think so. I think so, because the BIM technology is actually creating new, new, new labor spaces. Those BIM manager, BIM coordinator, BIM engineers that didn't exist like 10 years ago, or they exist, but they were called like CAD draftmen or CAD managers and so on and so on. A friend of mine is, has such company, which they are helping architects to automate their tasks in project production mm -hmm. so so for sure those companies will come up they will startups are growing and growing in the in the construction industry because of BIM but this is I think this is great because when when we um, when we for example take the architect he, he wants to create a beautiful building you know and he don't want to take time to make some, I don't know, adjustment in their software or to mm -hmm. play with data and so on, so on. That's why he's giving it to another person and focusing on what he's doing the best. Mm -hmm. And this is great. And I think that there will be a place and it's create right now there, there is a, a lot of space when, when companies can help like designing companies in different, in different uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cause parametric design programmation they, they're all like becoming like uh, mainstream yes the integration mm -hmm. of it is more and more obvious on on, on even challenging projects mm -hmm. the same is big data it, mm -hmm. it, it starts to play a, a big role in the real estate market you mentioned also the architects will team up with such external and, and new players which will come so there will be like the design team and the beam engineering team, but not as engineer as we know it, but has a, a whole discipline. What is the future of the architecture and engineering? What, what, what would be the job of an architect, an engineer in five to 10 years, um, if they are not beam? Of course, it depends on the country or the or organization or company which they are working on. If it, it is, uh, Polish company which has like family Polish company with five people who are doing 2D drawings they then don't want to transist so I think that their architectural job will not change a lot in five or ten years but mainly when we are talking about organizations or architect uh, companies which right now they are using BIM and want to embrace the technology so I think that uh, architects and engineers were, will work closely with IT world. Uh, right now we can see that the data which is produced is very valuable. Architects and engineers, from my perspective, should not be responsible for this data. They should 
actually not resp not responsible for handling and managing this, those data. For creation, yes, but no for managing. There should be a different division which is taking care of it. Engineers and architects should do their job with designing, creating mm -hmm. the, the building, but the data side should be yeah, like taken from them. Yeah. So so they they can focus on their stuff and another specialist will take care of data and mm -hmm. they actually don't need to be from my perspective they actually don't need to be engineers like civil engineers to manage those data because those data might be like um, we can take uh, people from finances which are good with data and mm -hmm. and give them the task to manage the data construction data for example mm -hmm. construction mm -hmm. project data they should be good with how to handle the information to get an output here and uh, sorry input here and output in uh, there where somebody will consume those data so so i think that, that the architects and engineers will be very close to mm -hmm. it world mm -hmm. so a, a lot of new players will come to the construction industry there will be a change in in different uh, job positions so maybe it will be not beam, there will be a beam manager but we can say there will be building database manager yeah yeah for example obviously such a transition needs a lot of education because you need to understand the, mm -hmm. the, the context of it and there is a lot of training which which need to be done for these new jobs how yourself do you see your daily job in five to ten years coming from construction engineer mm -hmm. uh, to know as a, a software uh, developer uh, or mm -hmm. a platform developer that's the good question um, actually ten years it might be a, a too long but I think in five years I would like to teach people things which I know right now i love to teach people that's um, it, it's something that uh, gives me gives me gives me joy my mother is <laughs> she's a teacher i was a teacher for 10 years uh, like a um, personal teacher for maths like i i was teaching kids when i was uh, the, during the studies so i like to teach people and i think that uh, uh, this beam education side of of the industry is is the place where I would feel myself comfortable, and and I think in five years it will I will be there. That's what I, I'm thinking. But okay, we will see. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Ignace, said, thank you very much for for your time. Thank you, Julian, for for having me here. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you for for watching. We stay in touch. New episodes are coming, and we hope you like it. Leave us some comments and some questions if you have. Until next time, thank you very much. Merci.